Hey CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here, and this is your lecture on soils. So, um, famous guy by the name of FDR said, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Dirt is pretty important. We need to understand, like, the properties of soil and, well, the human impact on soil if we're to maintain agricultural production to the level that we enjoy today. So let's dig in to some soil and learn how all this works. Um, our outline for the day looks like this. We're going to talk about what soil is, how do we use, abuse, and conserve soil, and then eventually we'll get into some ideas of sustainable agriculture. Uh, here's soil. What is soil? Soil is uh, not just the dirt beneath your feet. It's a mixture of eroded rock, minerals, organic matter, water, air, and living organisms. So when you pick up a handful of soil and you're letting it sift through your fingers, there's a lot more to it than just dirt, okay? How soils are formed. Well, I think Mr. Kennedy's probably the only one old enough to say that he's actually seen rock become soil, uh, but the reality of it is, is it does take time. There's all kinds of weathering that can occur uh, to break rock down into soil. You got to start with, with rock, okay, to make soil. And uh, then that rock has to go through biological, chemical, and physical weathering, uh, have organic matter added to it, and lo, we have soil. Wow, okay? It could take hundreds of years for this to happen, depending upon where you are and uh, the levels of erosion and weathering that are occurring there. Biological weathering is weathering that is performed by plants and fungus uh, as they grow down into the crooks and crevices of rock, they can break it apart. Chemical weathering is what's going to occur from oxidation, exposure to sunlight and water. And physical weathering, that's just, you know, breaking rock down into smaller and smaller chunks through the freeze-thaw activity that goes on between, you know, the night uh, versus daylight hours or winter versus like spring and summer hours. The organic component that has to be added comes a little bit later. So we'll take rock, we'll break it down into like basically gravel. And as that gravel forms, well, you might get insects, you might have small plants like weedy grasses, stuff like that, that attempt to make their home in this gravel. As they complete their life cycle and die, their body becomes the organic matter that starts to build the soil. Or maybe there's soil somewhere else supporting plant life like trees and that sort of thing. And the leaves from those things blow into this area and contribute to the organic material in the soil. No matter what, well, rock alone is not dirt. It's not soil. It's got to have an organic component that comes from the decomposing plant material, animal waste, animal bodies themselves from the surrounding area. Okay. Once we get it to a point where they're completely decomposed, we have what's called humus. Okay. Not hummus. That's a garbanzo bean dip that, well, tastes quite good with pita bread, but that's a different story. Um, humus is the organic material that is broken down, decomposed, and will mix with the mineral content of soil to form soil. Okay. All right, so minerals, that's the rock that's all broken down, and uh, basically that will dissolve into maybe soil water and could be taken up by the plants. The organic material that comes from plants is also important to support life of other plants that are growing in that soil. The more organic material you have, the more life that soil can support uh, so it's really, really a, a, a direct connection and really important. Now, as far as soil is concerned, it's probably, aside from water, like the number one essential resource for agriculture. Um, agriculture has dramatically changed our environment. It alters patterns of vegetation and soil production and water resources worldwide. But at the end of the day, um, aside from water, let's just put it this way. You can't grow crops unless you have good soil. Okay, so like you got to have soil for agriculture. 
If you attempt to grow crops in soil that is quote unquote subpar, well, then your only hope is to employ like chemical fertilizers to try to bolster the nutrient content of the soil to support your, your crops. And that's just expensive and maybe risky for humans that you know, just spray these fertilizers or ingest them. Um, some agricultural lands have been severely depleted in just a few decades, while others have been sustained for centuries. So it's really dependent upon how the, the farmer or the, the people group in the area use the land as to whether or not that land can be used sustainably or not. Some farming practices degrade agricultural resources and some practices help to restore and rebuild those resources. We're going to learn about both as we go through all of this. Okay, So soil itself, well, it is a renewable resource. Um, you, you should be able to grow crops in it year after year after year as long as you take good care of that soil. And I know that sounds weird, but there's truth to it. You can't just keep growing like heavy nitrogen feeding, you know, crop after crop after crop and deplete the mineral and nutrient content, the organic uh, nutrients of the soil without re ever replacing them. Uh, you basically will leave a barren wasteland behind. So soil is actually considered a renewable resource, but it has to develop gradually through the weathering of rocks and the accumulation of organic material. Growing heavy feeding crops that will pull that organic material out uh, faster than it can be replenished and then nothing will grow. Um, probably the most important component of soil that is looked at for agriculture is what we call topsoil. Topsoil accumulation is actually a really slow process. It only accumulates uh, at about a rate of one millimeter a year. So we need to be really careful with our topsoil so that it can be replenished and renewed indefinitely. We definitely want to avoid things, like I said before, heavy feeding crops or maybe even leaving, you know, soil topsoils exposed to, you know, winds and rain and erosion. Uh, severe erosion rates can exceed upwards of 25 millimeters of soil a year. There's no way topsoil deposition can keep up with that type of removal process. One of the worst cases of topsoil removal in history, you probably read about it in your English class in a book called, hmm, The Grapes of Wrath, right? The Dust Bowl, like we're going to talk more about that in a minute. There are six components to good, healthy soil. Soil is actually a marvelous and complex substance. I wish you, you know, had the time or you know, maybe just the inclination to grab some of that stuff, put it under a microscope, get it under a magnifying glass, check it out because there's all kinds of stuff in soil. So you're going to find that all soil should have some you know, proportion of sand and gravel in it, silts and clay, dead organic material, and then what's called soil flora and fauna. Now, that's code for living stuff, okay? So there's living plant and animal material in soil. There's water and air all in soil, okay? So those are our six major components. That brings us to variation in soil composition. Aside from the six components, the proportion of those six com components we have um, will give us different soil types, which can then support different you know, plant and animal life um, as a result of the qualities of that soil. So soil texture is really, really important. The texture is the amount of sand, silt, and clay in the soil. And uh, it's, you know, the, the first thing that we reach for when we're trying to describe or characterize the soil. Loam soils are actually considered the best for agriculture because they have a nice mixture of sand, silt, and clay, which means they hold a, a relative large amount of organic material, but they still have air space in there and, uh, and will also allow like water to filter through without pooling up and drowning plant roots. Brazilian tropical so soils are deeply weathered red clays um, and actually have very little organic material. It's kind of ironic that here you have a tropical rainforest with, I don't know, upwards of 100 plants per square meter, but yet the soil is basically trash. Like, not trash because humans have done something to it, but because of all the rainfall. 
Well, it rains like 200, you know, centimeters uh, plus a year in tropical forests. And with all that water uh, traveling across the surface of the soil, it leaches out and washes off all of the topsoil and all of the uh, mineral content and nutrient content of the soil. The only way that tropical rainforest actually is able to survive is like the plants that are there drop their leaves and those things decompose really, really fast in between rainstorms and put at least a small amount of nitrogen and other um, inorganic nutrients back into the soil so that those plants can eke out a, a survival. If you clear the land of, of plants, then that cycle is broken and it's nearly impossible to get plants to come back and grow even though you're in the tropical rainforest, okay? Probably the best soils in the United States are, well, in the heartland of the United States, which were once our grasslands. Um, our grasslands had rich, thick, um, you know, grassy root systems that added like, you know, literally feet of organic material to the surface. And as such has basically been plowed and used for years for, for farmland. The black soils of the central U.S. are so rich in organic material that uh, you know, most farmers, especially dating back into the 1800s, not only did they never have to like pump water to water their crops, but you know, they never even used fertilizers or pesticides or anything like that because the soils were awesome. Not so true today, but back then, that's the way it was. Now, this is a soil texture pyramid. Um, when you take tests and when you're like researching your dirt, you're going to be expected to be able to take proportions of clay, silt, and sand and use this pyramid to arrive at a soil type, okay? So um, very, very important that you pay attention to where your zeros and 100% are on your scale. If something is, we're looking at this, is basically 100% clay, like zero silt, well, then it's clay soil, right? And as we add more and more silt along the way, until we get to almost about 50% um, silt, we don't really change the name to anything other than just clay. At about 50% silt and 50% clay, we call that soil type silty clay. Like that's how it works, okay? So at the end of the day, like you're gonna get some experience uh, by literally putting your hands in the soil doing a, a touch test to figure out how much, you know, sand and silt and clay is in there and then use a pyramid like this to, to name the soil, right? That's what soil scientists do. Okay, so moving right along. Let's go through some other properties of soil and, um, you know, see what, what those do and how they play out in the quality of our soil. So what I've got here is a couple of pictures of the grassland versus the tropical rainforest soils, just so you can see comparison, what I meant by organic material versus none, okay? Um, so on the left, we've got the grassland soils. On the right, we've got the tropical rainforest soils. Darker the soil, the more rich it is in organic material, and technically, the more life it should be supporting. Kind of ironic, considering rainforests and how they look versus grasslands. Soil, fauna, and flora. Um, flora and fauna in the soil, um, by and large, are made up of bacteria, algae, fungus, even insects. And, uh, you know, in a single, like, tablespoon of soil, you could have thousands of different organisms. A single gram contain, can contain hundreds of soil bacteria and, uh, and 20 meters of tiny fungal strands. So like you laid them out like in a row, you'd have like 20 meters. That's like 60 feet of fungus, folks. That's a lot, okay? Um, you could also have tiny worms in there called nematodes. Um, the nematodes burrow through this organic material. They create air spaces as they burrow. You could have larger insects, spiders, and mites that will loosen and aerate the soil. And, uh, you know, some of this bacteria even forms symbiotic relationships with plants like mycorrhizal uh, symbiosis. Uh, this is an association between plant roots and certain fungus um, that is so critical that if we didn't have this, well, like, I don't even know if we'd be here. This is the, you know, primary way that we get atmospheric nitrogen into a form that we can eventually use to make proteins in our body. Pretty crazy that it starts here, but that's where it starts, okay? Um, this picture is just meant to kind of illustrate how all the life 
is intertwined and ultimately ends up in soil. All right, some soil layers. Soils are stratified. Soils have horizons, if you will. Soils um, are divided up into layers based on what's in them. Horizons taken together make up what's called the soil profile. The O horizon is our organic layer where you find all the leaf litter and stuff sitting on the surface. The A horizon is your surface soil, which has mineral particles mixed with some organic material. The E horizon is what we call our washed out horizon. It has depleted soluble nutrients that are washed out as water percolates through the layers. The B horizon is your subsoil. Basically, this stuff is often dense due to the infusion of clays and has even less um, nutrients in it than the E horizon did. Um, then you have the C horizon and the parent material. The C horizon is pretty much weathered rock, like chunks of rock or gravel. Uh, and then the parent material would be bedrock. Like this, this it really isn't dirt. It's like supporting the dirt. Okay. Um, so this is just a cross section of a layer of soil for you to see those different horizons in. Just follow the O all the way down uh, to the A, the E, and the B horizon on this picture. Okay. And then if we go to this next one, you can now see a C horizon and the bedrock um, in the soil layering. Okay, very important. You got to remember your soil layers. So let's explore a little bit more detail of what's in these layers and, and an up close picture of what they look like. So the O horizon, remember, this is where all your leaf litter is. Um, it's rich in organic matter. Uh, this is where like leaves fall off trees and then they're decomposing like right there. The O horizon is how the tropical rainforest like makes a living. Those plants in the tropical rainforest are surviving because of the O horizon. Everything after that in the tropical rainforest is pretty much washed out. The A horizon is the dark and rich accumulated humus, not hummus, because that's the garbanzo bean dip. Okay. Another name for the A horizon is our topsoil. Okay. So having a big A horizon means you've got great agricultural land. Um, food comes from your A horizon. Right. So agricultural land is heavily, heavily dependent upon it. All right. So if I'll give you a second to jot some of this down, the soils are so important to our survival. Um, basically, we identify soils largely in terms of the thickness and composition of these upper layers in the farm belt. Um, the dominant soils are called mollusols. Um, these soils have really thick, organic, rich A horizons, which develop from deep dense roots when the land was originally like grasslands, okay? Um, the alpha soles are another soil type um, important for farming. Um, they're basically developed from deciduous forests and have a little bit thinner A horizon. So mollusols and alpha soles dominate most of the soils of the farming community of the United States. Here's your B horizon. So this again is your like washed out kind of um, alluvial loose soil that um, rests underneath your A horizon. You have less nutrient content here. If you were to try to dig this layer up and grow a plant in it, it probably would not do well. You'd have to fertilize it. This is your C horizon. You can see in the picture where the little like spatula scoop thing is, the orange guy. That's the C horizon. This is the deepest layer next to your your parent rock generally um, saturated with groundwater especially if someplace like where we live where we have this lovely material called hard pan um, you know that's right at the sea horizon where water will no longer like filter down to the lower strata and then you got your bedrock right which is what it is it's rock okay and uh, in the process of maybe becoming soil okay um, this is how we get our different horizons formed. Okay, so when you think about like, well, where did I get my B horizon, my A horizon, whatever, follow the picture here. We start with bedrock, right? That bedrock breaks down into parent material or parent rock. That parent rock gets some organic matter added to it, right? So it develops into the A horizon, um, leaving the parent rock as the C horizon. And 
that A horizon will develop a little bit of organic matter on top. So that's our O horizon. And as a result of water filtering down through the A horizon, some of the A horizon becomes washed out and we get a B horizon. Okay, takes time, right? This is not something that's gonna happen overnight. All right, so remember soils have texture and the different soils, different soil types, I missed a slide, there you go, have different layered profiles, okay? So like forest soils, you can see there on the column on the left, um, A horizons are, you know, fairly small. Um, you get into prairie soils, you get giant A horizons, desert soils, nearly no A horizon, right? Tropical soils, same thing, basically desert, okay? So different soil types have different layer profiles, okay? Remember, those profiles are what we use to classify them, and the profiles start with soil texture. I said a while ago, it's the proportion of sand, silt, and clay that we use to kind of classify our soils. Um, in terms of particle size, you're going to be tested on this. Um, gravel is big, sand is smaller, silt is smaller than sand, and clay is the smallest. A lot of times people get the silt and clay reversed. So it's the relative proportion of each of these that ultimately determines what type of soil we have. Okay, remember the soil texture pyramid, right? That's how we name those things. All right, now another thing that's important in terms of texture is porosity and permeability. So your relative proportion of sand, silt, or clay is gonna determine your porosity and your permeability. Porosity is the amount of space in between your soil particles, and permeability is how easily then water uh, can move through those spaces. Um, and as you go across your soil pyramid, something that, you know, has more sand in it is going to have higher porosity and higher permeability than something that is all like clay. OK, um, so that's really, really important to, you know, agriculture um, and anybody that wants to grow plants. OK, so that's a big deal. Um, also to take into consideration is the pH of your soil, soil that's acidic well, really limits plant growth, just like a soil that is super alkaline will limit plant growth. So the optimum soil pH is about 6.5 to 7.5. You go outside that range and plants are not happy, okay? That brings us to the age of soil. So when you think about how old soil is, that's kind of a tough one because, you know, Mr. Kennedy feels like he's as old as dirt. So um, the point being here is that older soils are usually mineral deficient because, well, there's lots of water that runs through them year after year after year and leaches that stuff out. And I do say usually because if they're managed right and if there's leaf litter and organic material on the surface, then maybe that can compensate for it. Recently formed soils are usually mineral rich. The San Joaquin Valley is geologically recent. Uh, so, you know, we have fertile soils in the valley and lots and lots of agriculture here. Okay, so that brings us to soil organisms. Now, we've already talked about the fact there's lots of things that live in the soil. So we're not going to rehash that. But I do want you to uh, differentiate those things that live in the soil into primary and secondary decomposition groups. Primary decomposers are our big things like worms and snails and pill bugs and stuff that aerate the soil. The secondary decomposers are all the things like bacteria and fungus that help recycle our nutrients and keep our soil like mineral rich, basically for generations to come. Okay, so it's really important that we're careful about, you know, pesticides and chemicals that we put in the soil, because not only does that stuff, you know, maybe persist for generations, but if it kills these things along with like your target pests, well, then your soil is literally going to slowly die and the minerals in it won't ever be replaced. Okay, so ladies and gents. That's the first part of our soil notes. Mr. Kennedy is going to pause for station identification, come back with part two, and we're going to talk about soil problems and fixes. I'll see you in a minute.